This week on The Destination Angler. But a lot of people, I mean, myself and a handful of other guys, you know, we definitely have a percentage of people that have fished the San Juan that know exactly what they're getting into, and we meet them in the morning when they show up with their their rods that are pretty typical for the river and know what to expect, and they come in and they do pretty good. But, like, the, the person who's brand new, never heard about the San Juan, doesn't know what to expect. You know, you, you can only prep them so much for what they're about to see. They get in the boat and they look down and there's hundreds and hundreds of fish below them. And I think that's one of the things you see a lot is people are looking at the, you know, 50 fish below the boat and their indicators dancing over there or their dry flies being eaten. <laughs> Dude, you got one, set the hook, you know. You're yelling, set. <laughs> and that was Rob Coddington on the San Juan River. Welcome to the Destination Angler Podcast, the podcast for anglers who travel. And I'm your host, Steve Haig. We go right to the source, the local guides and experts, to build your knowledge of top fishing locations around North America. It's a big world out there. Now go and fish it. I'm going away for a while, but I'll be back soon. Hey anglers, welcome back to another episode of The Destination Angler, brought to you by Angler's Coffee, perfecting the coffee experience for the fly fishing community and anglers everywhere with small batch coffee delivered to your doorstep. It's darn near perfect. And by Trout Routes, the number one fishing app, helping you find new trout waters so you spend less time on the road and more time doing what you love, trout fishing. And by Rocky Mountain Angling Club, offering uncrowded fly fishing in the Rocky Mountains since 1992. Exciting news here. We are about to hit a major milestone here at the Destination Angler, our 100th episode. And to celebrate, I sat down with John McLean, son of Norman McLean, who shares the fascinating story behind the story of the river runs through it and the Blackfoot River in Montana. We also have designed and made a special run of Destination Angler podcast 100 episodes t-shirts. So head on over to my website and check them out. And remember to hit that subscribe button to catch all the Destination Angler episodes coming your way. Hey, and if you like the show, please tell a buddy. Happy to announce that Ben Melenkoff of Denver is the winner of the Come Fish with Steve contest on private water in Colorado. Thanks to the Rocky Mountain Angling Club for arranging a day on a beautiful stretch of water in South Park. Ben, I'll see you in September. <music> And today our destination is the legendary San Juan River in northern New Mexico. And our guest is expert guide and fly angler Rob Coddington, Durango, Colorado. Southwest Colorado is absolutely loaded with world-class rivers like the Animas, Dolores, and Rio Grande, not to mention endless alpine lakes and streams. If you've not fished the San Juan, you're in for a wild ride today because it is considered one of the top tailwaters in America and wait till you hear Rob talk about the sheer numbers and size of the trout here. It's really incredible. Rob was born and raised in San Diego where he first learned to fly fish. He played college baseball and spent his summers in Jackson Hole, lucky guy, where he fell in love with trout fishing. He and his wife moved to Durango 24 years ago where he teaches history, coaches baseball, and guides for Durangler's fly shop. Today, Rob douses into the intricacies of this incredible tailwater and shares stories of 30-inch fish, the famous ant fall, and why a soft fly rod is the way to go on the San Juan. Also find out how the Dolores and the Animus Rivers are doing, and be sure to stick around to the end for a great overview of Rob's top fly picks, midge fishing tips, and his favorite shore lunch. Now let's hear from Rob. Welcome to the show, Rob. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. So how's the summer guiding season going for you? You're out this morning, right? I was, yeah, I was guiding up in the high country, uh, up north of Durango on a creek we call Lime Creek, and had a half day with a father and a son, and the weather's good, and the fishing's been great. We had a really big snowpack this year, and so we've had quite a bit of water, so a lot of our, you know, local rivers and streams have all been really hanging in there, uh, and the fishing's been following along. It's been a really good summer for us. How about that? Very good. Are, are there certain times of the year where you're really targeting the high country, are you just starting to get into the high country stuff right now? Have you been doing it for a couple of weeks? It's been a couple of weeks, you know, you typically post runoff, you know, we have really good Creek season, you know, anywhere from, it could be as early as early June, all the way to the end of September, you know, just basically the summer. And, uh, you know, we have a, just a ton of creeks that we can fish and, and uh, really fun dry fly fishing and 
brook trout, cutthroats, rainbows, even some brown trout if you hike in a little bit. Cutthroats are really, uh, you know, a target for a lot of people. But uh, we have a ton of brook trout and and uh, other fish in those creeks. It's a really cool opportunity to get out and cast a dry fly. So yeah, that sounds great. And uh, you're also doing some alpine lakes. And are you in the San Juans? Is there where you're going for the high country? We are, yeah. I mean, most of what we're doing is north of Durango, kind of between Durango and Telluride, Durango and Silverton, maybe a little bit to the east. But, you know, for the most part, up the 550 corridor north of town is where we're doing a lot of our creek fishing. And, you know, the Alpine Lakes, uh, those are all over Colorado. So, you know, it's kind of like Alpine Lakes for us is sort of throw a dart at a map and check out a lake. Sometimes you you <laughs> hit a home run and, and there's a bunch of cutthroats in there. And other times you find a high country lake that just looks real pretty and you end up kind of making some casts and looking at the mountain goats and the bucks nobody that are home. summering up there and there's nobody there. So that's part of the fun of the high country lake thing. That's We don't do a lot of guide work on our alpine lakes, but uh, those are kind of things that we like to do when we have days off, try to hike six, seven, eight, nine miles in and you know, oh get to places where other people aren't casting, uh, you know, to those fish. So that's, that's a big hike. Six, seven, eight miles is a big hike. I would, you got to be in good shape. Yeah. Or you, you're getting in shape while you're hiking there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So right. <laughs> I, it's, uh, yeah, but those are fun. Those are like, you know, those are kind of places that are, you know, a little bit of sense of adventure and take off. And like I said, you just never know. I mean, you can hear the, the legend and the lore from all the locals about what kind of fish live in what lake, but you know, that's something, like I said, we're kind of doing on our own time. But, you know, when fishing's as good as it's been uh, in the past few summers for us, we don't get a ton of time to go do that. But, uh, you know, when we do, it's a pretty special day. So, Great. So tell us about, you know, the other fishing opportunities. There. So you've got the Alpine Lakes. You've got some some stream creek fishing. And what are, like, the, the bigger rivers that you're taking people to? Well, our bread and butter is the San Juan River below Navajo Reservoir. I mean, that's a world-famous tailwater. You know, that's probably makes up a, a pretty good majority of our guide work throughout the 12 months of the year that we're working. But, you know, one of the kind of the things that we always tell people is we can take you 20 different places, uh, 20 days in a row within an hour or two of the fly shop and never take you to the same place twice. So, nice. you know, we just have a ton of opportunities with like the La Plata River and the Dolores, you know, it's had its ups and downs. So that's an interesting story behind that. But the Animus River with its ups and downs that it's had but you know the, all the creeks that we have i mean you look at a map and find a watershed around here and there's fish in it so it's we live in a pretty cool place sometimes you you know you try not to take it for granted but but we do know and you know, as a fishing guide it's a really great place because you know today i was on a creek tomorrow i'm going to be on the animus the day after i'm on the san juan so it's fun for us working out of durango just keeps the the variety is pretty outstanding for, for yeah, I'll say. the client and the guide so Right. Well, how do, you, how do you decide where you're going in the morning? You know, it, it just depends. Like if most of the time people, our shop staff is really good at talking to people when they first, you know, call in on the phone and, hey, what are you looking for out of your trip? Uh, you know, we have, and they offer the options and if someone wants to go hiking. We talk to them about the creeks, you know, and if someone wants to catch big fish, we talk to them about going to the San Juan or the Animus. And so sometimes if it's kind of a guide's choice, uh, we get a uh, you know a text every single night with the client's information, and so we'll call ahead, you know, as the guy okay. and check in with people, and just kind of see if we're all dialed in and on the same page just for expectations. So, okay, how many guides do you guys have working in your shop? Oh man, I would say anywhere between twelve and eighteen kind of contract through Duranglers, you know, get the phone call during the summertime, and there's probably a regular guide staff of anywhere from six to ten throughout most of the year, but. You know, you add part-time guys in the summertime because it's so busy for us. So, yeah. Tell us a little bit about, I'd love to hear about the Dolores and the Animus. You, you said the Dolores has had some ups and downs. I knew the Animus had. I didn't know that about the Dolores. Yeah, you know, the Dolores is a place that, you know, it's kind of off the radar. And, and uh, you know, a lot of people used to know the Dolores as a really famous tailwater um, coming out of McPhee Reservoir. And it's a pretty special place. And I, you know, a lot of people would probably cringe that I'm even mentioning it, but I think it's important to talk about it because it's, it's one of those places that's, you know, in the nineties, it was a really cool place, kind of off the beaten path, really nice fish over there. And then the water, there's a lot of call for that water from agriculture over in the Dove Creek area and the Western side of Colorado. And at one point they dropped that flow down to seven CFS and, you know, when any, oh my when gosh. 
yeah, any river drops that low, you know, all the bug life and the habitat goes in the tank and very few fish survive because there's just not a lot of water. But then in the early 2000s, it kind of came back and was fishing pretty good. And it was a really cool opportunity for people to kind of get like a Spring Creek stock and, you know, spot and stock experience with real wild, wild fish. And, and uh, but just, I believe about a year ago, uh, they had to drop the water back down to almost like zero coming out of the dam. and uh, you know, those fish had bounced back pretty nicely over the last couple of decades, but they went in the tank again. And of course, you know, it's followed by this year with a giant amount of snowpack and that river typically runs at like 70 for its base CFS and it will float as high as 4,000 CFS this year. So, oh my gosh. You know, wow. So, you know, that's great to get the water back, but a lot of those fish died last year. So that's a river that's constantly that's up and bad. down. And uh, yeah, it is too bad because that was a cool option for people to come and and fish with us you know not a lot of fish a lot of rattlesnakes a lot of desert kind of you know hidden away stuff it's you know a bunch of fishing guides i know they their daughters have the first name or the middle name dolores because it's such yeah. a special place to everybody but yeah right now it's it's not in a place that i don't think i've been to the dolores for two or three seasons just because it's been struggling with water which is unfortunate so not a good one. Oh, what about the animus i've heard i've heard the animus has been very up and down over the years the animus is, yeah, it is. And, um, you know, now we're kind of in a, in a, it's starting to bounce back again. And, and, uh, you know, there's some really nice fish in the animus river that made it through, but it's, it, you know, it's constantly experiencing, you know, water quality issues with all the mining up in Silverton and, uh, you know, over the past 150 years. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years ago we had a fire, the water was real low and then we had a fire and then we had a giant monsoon rain that washed a bunch of soot into the river. And so that's the latest uh, issue with the, the animus. But the one good thing about the animus river is, uh, you know, our local biologist is constantly trying to, you know, keep the animus in a place that's, you know, recreation wise is, is a good place and a destination for people. I guided the animus yesterday and there were actually a pretty good number of fish in there. It was kind of a fun half day that people I had never fly fished and caught a handful of rainbows and browns that were all, you know, 12 to 18 inch fish. And, Oh, so it's nice. coming back and it's, you know, and it's an urban setting. It's right in the middle of town. So it offers a really cool experience for people to come in and we offer float trips on the Animus and, uh, you know, there's some really nice fish in the Animus River. You just gotta, you gotta work for them. It's not like the San Juan River where you can look down and see, you know, dozens and dozens of 20 inch fish, you know, it's kind of one of those rivers. Really? It's a free stone and you got to work at it. So. Okay. Well, we're going to get to the San Juan in a second, but, uh, you mentioned the mining that went on, you know, Silverton and imagine other places. I I read that there are, what is it, 70,000 mines, abandoned mines in Colorado and a bunch <laughs> down by you guys. Small correction here, there's actually 23,000 abandoned mines in Colorado, according to the Colorado Geological Survey. And uh, what I mean, what happened? So these mines are still leaking stuff into these rivers? Sort of. I mean... So, I mean, you can walk around the high country. I had a mountain goat tag a couple of years ago. I was hunting. A, I had a mountain goat tag to hunt with a rifle. And I went up there with my wife and was looking around the high country in the place where we were kind of checking out mountain goats. And you'll be walking along and there's just like like a board in the middle of the tundra. And it's like the, the ventilation shaft for a mine, oh my you know, that where they cut it into the mountain 100 and whatever years ago so that you know, they could keep ventilation going into these mines that go way into the mountain. And, you know, so basically the long story short, you know, when it rains in the high country, you know, a lot of those ventilation shafts are just left, you know, and a lot of it has to do with the, you know, the Mining Act of 1872, where they just basically said, you know, if you turn, turn this land over to the federal government, you can walk away from the mine and don't have to worry about cleaning it up. Essentially, I mean, there's more to it than that, but that's the basics of it. And so you have these mines and these shafts all over the San Juan Mountains that, you know, it's this really pristine area, but there is still the remnants of those mines from the late 1800s and the early 1900s for that. Yeah. Those monsoonal rains and snow runoff and whatever else, you know, get down those mine shafts and, and most of those mines, you know, have like a bulkhead or a, some sort of dam that just, you know, basically is a plug for the mine and that water and chemical kind of builds up behind those bulkhead dams. And like we had the Gold King mine spill, I think, and I can't remember the year, but it's a few years back and they were going to clean it up. And, you know, the EPA hit the, the bulkhead dam and 
busted the all the chemical in the water and i think it was like three four million gallons of water came out into one of the creeks and then walked really? out through the animus and wow you know and that always i was guiding elk hunters at the time and a lot of people were like oh god all your fishing is in the tank and that's not actually the case you know the that happens kind of regularly the animus is a very resilient watershed and so you know maybe not to that magnitude but you know you always see for a long time you would see you know the the river would be you know a little bit yellow a little bit gray a little bit red and you kind of tell where the rain storm had been the night before based on the color that the animus was in the morning during oh, the really? monsoon season oh my well, gosh yeah now they're starting to do some really amazing cleanup work you know there was some super fun work that came up and other, you know, entities like Trout Unlimited and, and some of the, you know, water conservancy issues or entities came in and they're starting to really clean up that area right now. And you can really tell the water quality in the animus is really picking up. We're starting to see stone That's flies great. again. We're starting to see yeah. a really nice caddis hatch. Yesterday there was a great PMD hatch. So, you know, Colorado, all of Colorado has that, you know, history of mining and a lot of our rivers, um, you know, I've had to go through that, but you know, the cool thing about it is people are really, they see the importance of recreation in the, in the state. And so there's a lot of effort, you know, to clean up those areas and get these watersheds back because fly fishing brings in a lot of money and a lot of uh, revenue. And, and so does water, you know, kayaking and river rafting and all these things. So water quality is a big issue. And, and there's been a lot of really positive effort to clean that up. And, you know, when the water's better, the fishing's better and everything seems to be better. Yeah. So. Yeah, actually, I was looking at my notes. It's 23,000 abandoned mines and caught not 70,000. And you told me a couple of weeks ago when we first talked that your son caught a really nice brown in the Animus. He did. He caught a 25-inch brown in February in the Animus Ooh. River. That's as pretty a fish as I've ever seen anybody land. I mean, super healthy, a wild fish, you know, that was raised in the river. Probably made it through the, you know, the fire sludge a few a few years ago as a kind of a one or two year old age class fish and, and he's catching that fish, you know, right in town in February. We went out yeah. on a nice forty degree day and you know, he caught that fish I think on his tenth or twelfth cast and I mean, that's like the fish of people's lifetime and that kid right. seventeen, eighteen year old kid oh, out nice. for an afternoon with his dad catching that fish. So I saw two or three of those fish over the last few weeks and the animus just not, you know, able to get a hook in them. But you see him eating stock rainbows or like juvenile fish and they take your breath away when you do see them and it's pretty wild when you're right underneath you know yeah that's Texas cool. barbecue in town so what was he doing when he caught it like what kind of fight was it Is that what yeah what was he throwing where where was the fish what kind of take did he get that kind of thing oh we're just nymph you know in the winter time we're fishing a nymph just like some beadhead nymphs probably prince nymph or a copper john something pretty standard issue and fish in a big deep hole on a nice warm day in the middle of a little bit of a midge or a blue wing all attached and here comes a giant fish you know and eats that eats that fly and pretty fun fight you know i got a a gopro in the winter time from a friend because i have a bird dog that i take quail hunting and, and so i was kind of playing with that gopro and i that was the first time i ever gopro anything on my head and i'm there's a lot of it I probably have to edit out coaching my son up on how to catch that giant fish. But but yeah, it was pretty big. fun to get the whole thing on video and listen to our interaction and our laughing and our, our kind of, you know, that? scolding each other. But yeah, it was cool. So you got a picture of that fish by chance? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I can probably find a way to send that to you. So love to see that. That'd be awesome. Hey, anglers. You've heard me talking about anglers coffee for quite some time now. And I have a question for you. Have you tasted it yet? Well, if you have, then you know what I'm talking about. It's darn good coffee, isn't it? Hey, if you're like me, tasting's believing. And believe me, this coffee tastes great. My wife and I are hooked on it. Angler's Coffee offers an impressive spectrum of flavor profiles, so there's something for everyone. You know, when you're spending a day on the water, you need a great cup of coffee to carry you through, like the Coachman's Blend. Named after the famous Royal Coachman, you'll love the design of the bag as much as the coffee. This blend of medium and dark roasted coffee from Central and South America produces a flavorful and smooth cup with notes of chocolate and baking spices and a smooth finish. Order some today and save 10% with a custom subscription like I did. You pick the coffee blends you want, and they're delivered right to your doorstep. And if you're not 100% satisfied, they'll give you your money back, no questions asked. No kidding. A percentage of each sale goes to some great nonprofit organizations in the fly fishing community. 
So put a smile on your face, just like I did, and give it a cast. That's Angler's Coffee, tastings believing. Huge news, folks. The number one fishing app, and I'm talking trout routes here, has been updated to include the entire lower 48. That's 50,000 streams mapped and classified into four categories and 350,000 hand curated public access points marked and ready for you to explore. You know, there's nothing more exciting than finding that new trot stream or access point. I'm a huge fan of trot routes because they make it so easy. Say goodbye to stumbling around country roads looking for your next spot because Trout Routes provides every detail you need for each stream, including public and private bridges, stream flows, trail access, where to park, camping opportunities, boat ramps, and more. No service, no problem. You can save maps for offline use. With Trout Routes, I've found dozens of new streams and access points I never would have known about. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for Trout Routes today on your Apple or Android phone. Okay, so I've been to the San Juans. When I was a kid, I went an outward bound, and we hiked all through the San Juans up by Uri and Telluride and everything. So it's absolutely spectacular. But is there any – can you describe how spectacular these mountains are? I mean, yeah. I, it's hard to do it justice unless you put your eyeballs on it. But, you know, we live right next to the Weminuch Wilderness, which is a really vast wilderness area kind of uh, to our northeast and and – you know, just really cool opportunities, big herds of elk. Um, there's a premier elk unit in the Weminuch Unit 76 that a lot of people, you know, wait a lot of years to, to hunt elk in that unit. And uh, you have just big, big mountain peaks, uh, a lot of aspen trees. Um, we're starting to get a little bit of beetle kill here and there, but, uh, you know, not as bad on our side as it is on the on the eastern side of the Continental Divide. But, you know, big drainages, real steep country. You know, and just more mountains and, you know, you have to be pretty savvy and, and familiar with your map to, to name all the mountain peaks. And then as you work your way down into Durango, you know, you're you're up there at 12 and 13,000 feet, just 30 or 40 miles north of town. And then um, or as high as that, you know, and, and yeah, then you get right. down into Durango at 6,500 feet and then you go another hour to the south of the San Juan and you're in the 5,000. So we have a really diverse geographical area here you know, our river in Durango's cottonwood riverbanks and uh, real pretty vistas, you know, big red cliffs. And, and, uh, you know, as we get down in San Juan, it's big sandstone cliffs and boulders and pinion juniper terrain. And so we have such cool variety. I think that's what's such a draw for so many people is, yeah. you know, I'm up at 10,000 feet today fishing in a, you know, a, a high, high country Creek catching wild cutthroats and brook trout. And then tomorrow I'm, I could be in the desert fishing for, giant tailwater trout you know so that's super cool so let's switch gears and and talk about the san juan for a minute so it is the destination for people to, who come down there it sounds like uh but you know why is it so famous i think it's just the numbers of big fish and the the way that that river can hold can handle all the pressure that it handles huh. and still produce such great opportunities for people to catch such a world-class fish you know it's uh very popular there's always a lot of people there but like two days ago when i was there fishing uh with the young lady i had i we were kind of up in the upper sections of the river closer to the dam and i kind of looked downstream and looked upstream and i said to her i was like robin check this out look downstream and look upstream it's three o'clock in the afternoon and we were the only people in sight on a friday you know oh, and okay. so yeah and so there's so many opportunities to actually like get in there and you know everybody kind of oh god the combat fishing this and that but like you can always get away from the crowd at that river always yeah so and i think what draws people there is it's just there's such a great opportunity that water's clear those fish are big you can catch them it's it's just a cool place one of the i would guess you know everybody's proud of their their home water but it's got to be one of the top five tailwaters in the united states i mean it's just yeah, a really really cool place to come down and catch a big fish. So, so I read that the first four miles below Navajo Dam have eighty thousand trout in it. Is that is that true? Does that even sound right? It, it does sound right. I mean, sometimes we throw out numbers in the hundred thousands, but like, you know, you, you, there's a ton of fish in there. I, it's just they manage it really nicely. That it's all catch and release. You know, in in New Mexico, if you're a hunter, you're familiar with the idea of 
high demand quality and then standard hunting tags. Well, uh, with New Mexico fishing right now, they're trying to take advantage of the concept of, you know, selling the chilies and whatever else, but, you know, red chili water is like their hottest, most, you know, um, best opportunity to, to catch a trophy fish. And, and we've always known it as the quality water, but now New Mexico is calling it red chili water, which is Oh, right. basically it's, funny. it's like saying gold medal or blue ribbon water yeah red know? chili water okay <laughs> i yeah. heard that so yeah but yeah it's a cool opportunity and such diverse fishery like you can fish like we were talking earlier today you can you know use size 26 midges you can fish a big black ant you can throw a streamer early in the morning and catch a fish that's you know 30 inches long i mean you can really there's there's something for everybody at that river so yeah, that's amazing. What what's the biggest fish that you or your customer have gotten? Somebody just asked me that the other day and I kinda of went through my my Rolodex, I guess, or my yeah. my memory, my mind. And I think twenty seven inches is the largest fish that I've landed wow. with a client. I know that I've had a couple of those big giant brown trout you see pictures of that are in the thirty plus range, but you know, one of them I oh, fought gosh. with a fella for a while in the winter time he puts it on a big black leech you know and the lake turns over in the winter so you don't really know what you have on you can just kind of assume by the way the fish is acting and when that brown trout kind of got close to the boat and, and uh you know gave us a, our first glimpse of it that was a that was a 30 inch fish i mean that's one of the only times i've hooked one of those where i really had a legit wow. shot but i've seen you know a lot of guys around here are catching that fish in the last four or five years several guys from from many of the local outfitters are catching that i mean there's a famous picture on one of the websites i can't remember who caught it but uh one of the old time guides on on the san juan caught a what was it i think it was a 31 inch brown trout and it had a 20 inch fish in its mouth and it ate a oh really a, a, oh my egg. gosh i mean so <laughs> like, you know it's they're they're in there you see them every now and then but uh you know the average size fish in that river is probably like 16 17 18 inches you know two days ago the girl i had i'm not kidding when i say she she probably landed 15 or 16 fish over 20 inches. I mean, like, it really? was awesome. Oh, my gosh. So much fun. That's so, incredible. I mean, that's unheard of. I know. It was cool. So That is amazing. Well, no wonder it's so uh, popular. I almost said crowded, but you said you can beat the crowds, but and sometimes it's not crowded, huh? Hey, folks, I don't know about you, but it feels like the world of trout fishing is getting more and more crowded. But fly fishing shouldn't be a battle. Fight the fish and not the crowds and join the Rocky Mountain Angling Club. Members receive exclusive access to quality, unpressured, catch-and-release fly fishing by way of arrangements with private property owners. You'll enjoy access to over 40 premier fly fishing properties in Colorado, Wyoming, and New Mexico. Every major watershed in Colorado is covered, plus 25 trophy-producing ponds and lakes. I first fished with the Rocky Mountain Angling Club a few years ago and was super impressed with the quality of the fly fishing and the super helpful staff. These guys helped me plan my trip, explain which properties were fishing best. I even called the club for help with fly selection while standing knee deep in a trust stream. Let me tell you, these guys are true fly anglers. Join before September 30th and get 100 bucks off your initiation fee. And they'll extend your membership through 2024. Just mention you heard about them on the Destination Angler podcast. So what are you waiting for? Gold medal fly fishing opportunities abound. Get on the stick and call the guys at the Rocky Mountain Angling Club and join today. Fight the fish, not the crowds. That's rmangling.com. What, I mean, what is your strategy for, I mean, how do you beat the crowds? Well, you see a lot of the fishing guides that are, um, that have been there a while, you know, and a lot of us are, know each other and have a lot of respect for one sure. another, but like, you'll see guys, everybody does a little bit different program. You know, it's, there's two or three sections of that river that you can float. And, uh, you know, the main section is from Texas Hole to the gravel pit. That's the famous, you know, section of the river that, you know, a vast majority of people float. And so guys will do things like, you know, they'll float down a mile, get ahead of the crowd, fish, you know, by themselves all morning long, maybe see another boat. There could be 30 launches on the river and you can float down the river and get into some spots where like nobody's fishing early in the morning. You can really have that run to yourself like all morning long and uh, maybe see one or two other people and and uh, you know you can always like double back you can take out early go back up to the texas i mean there's a bazillion things you can do you can get out and wade fish a little bit up some side channels 
if you want to stay away from the crowds, even on the busiest day, you can you can really kind of fight the crowd. And most of the people, there's an etiquette down there, right? If you see yeah. someone fishing a run, the next guy will usually, you know, fish below them. Or sometimes people will ask politely, hey, man, can we do this run with you? I mean, you don't see a lot of guide conflicts down there very much. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah, I know other places in the West that can be a thing. But, you know, most of everybody down there has worked around each other for long enough that, you know, we always kind of give each other our space and you can catch those fish. So. Right. Like how, how sensitized are the the fish to the guide boats floating over them all day long? I mean, does it put them down for a while or can you get right no, in there after really, a boat? Okay. They're pretty conditioned to it, you know? And so, and that turns some people off, but it turns the majority of people on because, you know, it's, it's like today walking up to a, you know, a run in a little Creek and I don't know, 11 year old boy, he really did a good job. And, you know, a couple of times he stomped into that hole and, 20 or 30 brook trout and cutthroat would just go hide underneath a log and it's over. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And San Juan, the nice thing is if you kind of ease your way into a run, you know, the other day when that gal caught a lot of those nice fish, she, we were sight fishing to them, you know, within probably two rod lengths of where we were standing, you know, 15, 20 feet away. And you're sight fishing to 22, 23, 24 inch fish watching them eat it. I mean, it's just, it's pretty entertaining. Uh, no matter how oh. many times you go down there, it's pretty entertaining when you, you know, get down there and those fish will bite and you can, who doesn't like to hang a big handful of 20 inch fish, you know, it's pretty right. fun. So. That's incredible. I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be fishing into a pot of fish that are that big, two rod lengths from me. I mean, I, I think I would melt if I saw that. <laughs> I mean. Some people do. Some people do. You, know? you have to kind of ease them into it. And, but, uh, it's fun. It, it tests your skills a little bit and your patience, you know, like Does it? there is a technique to it. We're fishing size 26, 24, 22 flies. Right. And so there is a technique to like not ripping the hand, you know, the hook set. What's the technique? What do you tell your clients? You know, the typically in the morning, if they haven't done it much, is I, one of the things I tell people, honestly, in the last couple of years is if you've, a lot of people seem to have fished and there's a lot of people that have fished for crappie and bluegill and I, the, one of the first things I ask is, have you ever caught a crappie? And they go, yeah. And I said, you have to set the hook on these fish just like a paper mouth crappie. You don't want to jam them. This isn't a bass where you can put it on your hip and you can drive home 30 pound braid into their jaw. You know, you like, you can't do that. You just kind of got to lift. You know, there's all kinds of analogies, right? Answer the phone, just set the hook like it's crappie, whatever you want to say. But, you know, it's a lot of times the hook is already set when you get that fish to eat. You just have to find tension on you know, find tension on that fish and, and have a soft hand with 6X tippet, you know, that's becoming more and more of a thing, Steve. I think more people all over the West are getting used to fishing five, five and a half, 6X tippet, even 7X tippet yeah. in places that receive a lot of pressure. And so that's not such a, you know, an abnormal thing, I think, for tailwater uh, fisher men and women. It's it's becoming more of a norm. And so I think a lot of people already kind of have that uh I guess, muscle memory on setting the hook, letting the drag work, you know, letting that fish run and tire itself out. And, you know, but if they haven't done that before, you know, you just try to coach them through it um, and, and talk to them about easing up. And we go through a lot of lessons on, you know, managing the line. That's probably the biggest thing with a tailwater fishery with, with midges and small mayflies is just teaching people to manage their line correctly. I think, the cast isn't as important as just managing your line and fighting that fish. And that's something we can work on all day long. People, the learning curves usually at a point where people can hang a few of those fish and get them in the net. That's why it's such a, again, that's why it's such a popular place. So. I mean, I feel like catching a big fish, like a 20 inch fish is a whole nother ball game. You know, there's a whole new set of skills that come into play. I mean, do you feel that way or you do this all the time? Well, I think that's especially true on years like this when we had uh, we had high water for yeah. 60, 70 days. Those fish sat around in high water and ate worms and scuds and bait fish. And, like, they are as healthy as they've ever been. Like, they are big, firm, awesome fish. And that water is always 42, 43, 44 degrees. Oh, that's cool. And the habitat's yeah. just so great. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, it's tail water coming out of a 18-mile-long reservoir. And so it's, it's just like the perfect habitat. It's really amazing trout habitat and bug habitat. And, you know, here in another few weeks, you'll probably start really seeing that blue wing olive pop off and 
people really show up in September and October for that dry fly fishing or like midge clusters. You know, we caught a handful of fish the other day that were 20 plus inches long on small little sparkle ants that kind of represent a midge cluster. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, you just have such a diverse, you know, fishery within a fishery, if that makes sense. You can do so many different things in so many different spots. It's like, I think the other day she and I covered probably like a half a mile of the river because we were just like so many fish on that opposite bank and yeah, camping out and catching. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah, so. don't leave fish to find fish, right? Yeah, that is a pretty true adage. All right, so back to this pod fishing. So I've got a, a, a pod of 20 inch plus fish feeding two rod lengths away. So what's the strategy mm -hmm. to get as many of those as you can out of that pod without putting the whole pod down? I think you definitely have to just be patient and try to like work your way into that pod. You know, like, you know, when you, you're talking pods, like we have pod fish, but like, I don't want to discount it, but those fish are used to, to anglers, you know, fishing to them. And so there might've been somebody there an hour ago, really whipping that water to a froth and, and putting a pretty ugly, you know, drift with a bunch of drag on that fish. But I think the, the thing that I, try to teach people and all the guides that I know is let's work one fish at a time and kind of work our way into that group of fish. You start on the edges? Yeah. You know, like, you know, and again, like I'm just picturing the other day in my mind, the last hour of our fishing with 25 or 30 of those big fish up in this little side run that we we're fishing to. And, like, you know, we're fishing a small yarn indicator, maybe three or four feet to a, like a number eight weight. I mean, so it's like a micro nymph rig. And yeah. a size 24 betis and a size 24 midge. And so just like taking your time and making one nice quality cast on that fish, you're not going to put that fish down on the San Juan. You just almost have to work it like you're fishing a dry fly. You're just working into that fish's feeding rhythm. And so that lighter yarn indicator is a big deal. A lot of people just okay. want to fish that big thingamabobber or these new, you know, yeah. airlock or twist on bobbers. And those, Awful. a lot of times those fish don't want to mess with that, you know, on, on the San Juan. So, you know, you put that yarn indicator on when you're in a wade fishing spot in a light nymph rig and you just ease your way into those fish and focus on his feeding rhythm and try to feed him. I mean, I think she had one little session there where she hooked like eight fish in her eight casts. I mean, like, I'm not BSing. It was some like really I was giggling. Fishing. I'm almost That's a 50 year old fishing. Man, you know, and I'm sitting here giggling huh. watching a fish because I'm yeah, like, I right. can't believe this, you know. So it was pretty cool. Was she pretty good angler? She was great. Yeah. She was from Wisconsin and, and, uh, you know, I think she had fly fished a little bit, but nice job, you know, she had done some fishing for like steelhead and big Browns and, but she was willing to learn, you know, and the people I had a couple of days before that were the same way. It was a father and a son and they were willing to learn. And it was so much fun to just work with them because they were eager to learn about, you know, this kind of unique right. style of fishing that you don't always see in a lot of places fishing the san juan's like fishing a big giant spring creek kind of oh is it okay. um, with just a lot of fish oh. just a ton of fish so i mean when you get your clients in the morning do you like do you ask them what their goals are for the day or like how do you figure out like this guy definitely wants to learn or this guy just wants me to put him on fish and he's going to do his own thing and i'm gonna keep my mouth shut like how do you kind of size them up just asking questions i think i think the best thing i do is just like what are you looking for today have you heard about the san juan okay what do you know about it you know, if they haven't heard anything about it and just happens to be where they've been, you know, essentially like a signs and, you know, but I'll show them my fly box and talk to them about, you know, these hooks are so small, but they're absolutely the, the tackle we have and the rods we have are designed to protect the shock on that tippet and to keep that, you know, that hook in that fish's mouth. This is not impossible. You can totally do it. But a lot of people, I mean, myself and a handful of other guys, you know, we definitely have a percentage of people that have fished the San Juan that know exactly what they're getting into. And we meet them in the morning when they show up with their, their rods that are pretty typical for the river and know what to expect. And they come in and they do pretty good. But like the, the person who's brand new, never heard about the San Juan, doesn't know what to expect. You know, you, you can only prep them so much for what they're about to see. They get in the boat and they look down and there's hundreds and hundreds of fish below them. And I think that's, one of the things you see a lot is people are looking at the, you know, 50 fish below the boat and their indicators dancing over there or their dry flies being eaten. <laughs> you got one set the hook, you know. You're yelling set. <laughs> yeah. And so 
that's a pretty common thing. It's like the fish of your life eats when you're looking at the other 50 fish off the stern. That's the way it always happens. You know, you look over for a second and your guide's yelling at you, set. And you looked away for one I second, know. you know. But I mean, it's cool because the the cool thing about the San Juan versus some of the other rivers we have is like the opportunity, your next opportunity is like two feet away because there's another fish right behind that fish. So it's not like fish in a barrel. You got to work for it. But like, yeah, it is a pretty huh. guide, client, angler friendly river for sure. Yeah. So Okay. Can you wade the whole thing or do you really need a boat to cover it? No, the first, I don't know, mile, mile and a half is from the dam to Texas Hole is all wade fishing only. And so that's, you know, a lot of times when we have wade trips, we'll take those people up there towards the dam or up in the braids above the Texas Hole. And, but, you know, floating the river offers you the opportunity to see three and a half miles of that river, and, you know, and you can go through a run and drift it. You can anchor because it's in a state park. So you can you can anchor on the river there and, and focus on a group of fish or, okay. you know, you can head hunt and, and go for, uh, you know, rising fish make long casts you know you see a lot of anglers that are really accomplished that come down to the san juan and they're coming down there with like a little you know size 14 16 18 ant and they just they look for noses popping up all day long and fish a dry fly and and they have great days you know so yeah yeah so do, is the boat just transportation like you're getting out and, and sight casting most of the time no i think boat you know fishing out of the boat is pretty classic you know a lot of it's nymphing i mean to be fair a lot of it is nymphing and and you know you'll get into a run and and cast your lines and you know pretty typical like run with a drift boat sometimes we can run 50 60 80 100 yard drifts maybe even further and you know okay. the longer the flies in the water the more chance you have to catch fish right and so we'll do that drift and if we want to we can turn back up and you know, go around that drift as many times as we want, as long as no one else is fishing there, or we're not in anybody's way. And, and, uh, you know, but you'll see a lot of guides, some guides kind of specialize in like going down to a spot, anchoring, letting their anglers work a certain pot of fish. Some people like to keep moving. Some people, you know, will row way down and just fish the big deep water and cast streamers and dry flies. I mean, just everybody's got kind of their own style, you know? I got you. Tell me about the the character of the water below the dam, like what's, you mentioned the first mile or so is only wade fishing. And then you just said something about deeper water. Give us a sense of like, how wide is it? What's the CFS? What are we looking at here? I mean, it's like a medium sized river. I think it's running right now at 700 CFS, but okay. it's, it's, you know, 500 is sort of base flow when things are good. And during high water, it got up to like 4,400 CFS this year. So, you know, typically you're going to see flows between like 300 and 500 CFS. Right now, later in the summer, the water will come up sometimes released out of Navajo Dam. There's a, I guess, a rule or a law on the Navajo Reservation that there has to be 500 cubic feet a second in Shiprock, New Mexico at all times to protect some native species. And Shiprock's a ways down on the Navajo Reservation. So right now, they bump the water up this time of year to seven, six, seven, eight hundred CFS when the animus starts to drop because the animus and the San Juan come together around Aztec, New Mexico. And um, when those two, when the animus drops and, you know, with all the water that's taken out or, you know, put back in for irrigation and, you know, whatever water use down in New Mexico, you, uh, there, that all has to be equivalent to 500 CFS and ship rock. So right now they're bumping a couple hundred extra CFS out of the dam to you know maintain that 500 cubic feet a second by the time it gets in ship rock new mexico which is good you know yeah. for the fish because you know water is good it's just sometimes on a low year navajo reservoir can get a little bit depleted the you know the whole entire colorado river watershed i'm sure you've read the news has been kind of in danger with like powell and like me being so low yeah there's been some problems yeah yeah, this year it filled up a little bit more. You know, the San Juan ends up in Lake Powell, and so there's there's a little bit of call for water there every once in a while. But for the most part, you're looking at 500 CFS, 350, 400 CFS coming out of the dam for a majority of the year, which is extremely weightable. It's a slow kind of, there's some deep pools, lots of riffles, really wader friendly. It's a little slick in the rocks, but like there are not many places where you can't get across the river. I mean, it's a very, very, uh, like I said before, angler-friendly river. Yeah, I didn't know that. And how wide is it? Probably, I'm thinking about the Texas Hole there. You know, at one point, you're, you're looking at maybe like a couple, two, three hundred feet wide. Maybe oh, in some big. places where it braids out, you're looking at 
maybe four or 500 feet wide where it shallows out and widens out in some braided really? sections and just, huh. but, uh, yeah, you know, for the most part, it's a medium sized river. It's nothing that's white water or anything like that. When it's high water, that water really pushes along and you can't really wade it too much. Right. It's more of a boat fishing game for that month or two months of high water, but that's why, but though. you can wait. Oh yeah. You can, you can wait a lot of it though. I mean, 400 feet across, a lot of anglers could fit in a river that's 400 feet across. Yeah. And a lot of it, I think is like, you're looking at probably more like hundred, 150, 200 feet across, you okay. know, like it's, it's not a huge river by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. It's, like I said, it's like a medium sized tailwater. It's nothing like the green or the big horn or the South Fork of a snake that runs 10 or 12,000 CFS. It's not like that. You know, it's I get you. 500 CFS and pretty doable. And it's in a sandstone Canyon I read. And, and so what is that? Just trying to think what that does to the fishing when you've got sandstone. It, and it sounds like sandy bottom in a lot of places. Is that right? There's a lot of silt. You know, a lot of that silt comes in during rainstorms. And uh, those are kind of fun times when when there's a, a, a gully washer, like kind of a flash flood. You know, you see all kinds yeah. of little sections of the river that then there'll be these big uh, patches of silt that came off of the hillside. Well, a lot of times those fish will go right up into that silt and they'll look like bone fish. They'll stick their nose right in that silt. And they'll like, when the worms pop out of the silt, they'll whack a worm. Oh, really? And they huh. get, oh, it's so fun because you can sight fish to these big giant fish that come up and get on that silt in like a foot of water. And you can fish a bigger, you know, a San Juan worm or some sort of annelid or, or whatever. And you can put it on that fish and sight fish to like a 20, 22, 24 inch fish. And it's pretty cool when that happens. It's, I'll you know. If it happens too much, it's not good for the watershed, but typically because it's a tailwater, you end up getting a pretty good flush and it moves that silt downstream. And there's been a lot of projects done by the Game and Fish and, and um, just a few years back, they there's a canyon called Simone Canyon that washes really bad sometimes during a flash flood. Well, the state came in and, and uh, with a lot of sportsman dollars, they came in and the bottom third of the river, they did a bunch of stream improvements to try to channelize the river prevent that silt from building up too bad in that bottom third. I know they went up in Simone Canyon a little bit and kind of try to re-divert some of the silt so it doesn't just wash into the river. So there's a lot of work to, you know, it's the desert. So they have to watch for that flash flood. And typically the, you know, now when Simone Canyon washes, it, it's not as bad because, um, because of all the work that the, you know, state of New Mexico came in and did yeah. really kind of save the day for that bottom third of the river. So. So Simone Canyon is below the tailwater. Uh, well, it's right in the tailwater. It's maybe three, four miles below the dam. Oh, it is. Okay. So you got to, if you're below that, you you might get hit with a flash flood if it's raining. I mean, sort of. It's not something you have to, I mean, we've, we've all been in the river on the worst rainstorms, you know, and it's not like anything like, oh God, you got to get out. I mean, you do, you probably <laughs> leave because it's pelting rain, but it's not like something okay. where it's not like you can't see it coming you know there's a big giant black cloud in the desert and you probably should go get in the truck you know so it's nothing that's too drastic or anything like that but the long-term effect is what's more concerning i guess is what's going to happen to that river post flash flood you know it's like but that river always has a way because of the consistent flow of pushing that silt away and those fish seem to kind of relish in the fact that they're getting this brand new silt with all these worms and i like the worms so Mother Nature finds a way and continues when habitat's really good, just sort of keeps beefing those fish up. So is the San, the San Juan worm pattern came from the San Juan River, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Do you still, you know, fish the same old pattern from whenever that was developed or have you guys, you know, experimented? And... No, I mean, it's wormology is a thing, right? People kind of tease, like, what's your wormology? What's your worm wormology. game? And like, <laughs> That's great. Yeah, most of the time you're... You don't see a lot of guys fishing San Juan worms um, unless it's high water. You know, you'll see guys fishing it a little bit, you know, smaller worms or annelids and things like that. But when that water clears up, those fish aren't going to come eat like a big three, four inch worm. But in high water, man, that's like they climb all over it. And so some of the biggest fish of the year are caught during high water because they're, you know, you're fishing 4X to a big four or five inch long worm on a size. 14 or 12 hook and you know you can really tangle with that that larger fish and get them in when you do hook them it's kind of fun but um those fish kind of they don't key on that as much when the water drops and you get that clear water again they key on the midge and key on the mayfly and the smaller annelids and you know things like that all right i get this what the heck is an annelid 
just kind of like I guess the best way to put it is like it's just basically a tiny little aquatic worm I mean you pick up a stick and there's all these little they look like they're super minuscule and tiny uh like okay around a mid looking guy like a mid pupa larva they're they're itty bitty you know size 18 20 22 but they're they're everywhere and those fish will really key on them when there's a lot of them moving through the river that's a pretty standard issue fly like a size 22 24 red annelid some people kind of emulate that annelid with a red hook <laughs> oh, really catch these fish huh. down there on san juan on a red hook but like typically uh you know you see a lot of people fishing that annelid and trying to keep it a fly fishing thing rather than just chucking metal in the water warm fishing huh so how many miles of good fishable water is there you know, that tailwater section is four miles, like you said, and then below that you can fish bait. So you'll see people on the bank of the river, you know, chucking power bait. But there are actually some really nice fish in there. So we'll float that section sometimes with people that, you know, just want to catch a lot of fish because there's a lot of stock fish in there and some brown trout. But, you know, then that third section down, you can float for another nine miles and get into more of a, uh, you know, a little bit more of a less crowded private land water scenario and you know, catch fish on nymphs and dry. So you're looking at probably like 16, 18 miles of river that you can fish. But most of that fishing occurs in that first four miles, six miles of the that's oh, below does. the okay. dam. So. All right. And, and you were talking earlier that it's in a state park, so you can anchor up and get out and all that stuff? You can, yeah. Okay. Just in that first four miles? Yeah. And I believe they may have changed the laws. I'd have to look to see, but you know, we've always just treated private land like private land. Like a lot of times when we're floating through private land, but I don't even put my anchor on the boat just to alleviate any kind of conflict with anybody. I just try to keep the boat moving. And, you know, I was raised like a lot of the guys that I know kind of old school Western fly fishing, you know, just like anchor wasn't really a thing. Just keep moving and keep chucking into the bank and keep that boat moving along. And, you know, I'll put my anchor on the boat on the San Juan, but I'm floating the Animus tomorrow in my boat. And I won't put my anchor on the boat just because. Leave it off. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, some of the first guys that were fishing in the West, they were in boats and rafts and moving along the river and, you know, instead of camping out and pounding on those fish. But sometimes on the San Juan or the Green or the Bighorn, you know, you got to focus on where you can catch some fish with your people. And so you'll see guys with anchors on the San Juan. So. Oh, interesting. Okay. What's your most memorable fish, either yours personally or with a customer? I mean, I hate to say it just because it's so recently. I don't really hate to say it, but that giant brown trout my son caught back in February has to be yeah. probably one of my favorite fish. I just, you know, I, I love him very much, but he's he's grown up. I probably took him fishing too much when he was a kid. He's a really beautiful caster, and he he does know how to fish. I, I don't know that he could, you know, go win a a tournament tomorrow you know i don't know how much he really knows but you know we were sitting there in february and it was a warm day and it's probably like 11 o'clock in the morning and he goes do you want to go fishing and i mean you know like kind of caught me off guard i was like yeah i want to go fishing what are you talking always about always say yes dad when you get that question yeah, right? you know what I mean? he's 18 <laughs> years old and i was like hell yeah i want to yeah. go fish let's go let's go so we went out and, our, and he doesn't have a good pair of waders so i like oh, let's run to the fly shop i'll get an extra pair of waders and you know, and so I, we only took one rod and the coolest part about that whole day, it was just like, you know, him asking, I think, but, but we, we have, we had had a lot of snow this winter and there's a couple of holes in town that are pretty good fishing in the winter time. And, and so we went and parked at the place where we parked in town there and, and, uh, we were walking through probably three feet of snow down one of the boat ramps to get down to the spot to fish. And there wasn't a track on the snow. So like oh, instantly, nice. you know, I'm, and, and yeah. on the other side of the river, I can see nobody would hiked down to this hole. We'd had probably six or seven days in a row of, of snow, and it's our first 45 degree day post snowstorm. So I said to him, I said, "Can you see the snow here?" And he goes, "Yeah, Dad, I can see the snow." Kind of like being a smart aleck. I go, "No, what yeah. do you notice here?" And he goes, "There's no <laughs> tracks." And I was like, "This could be a good thing." And and we got yeah. down to that that spot in the river, and and I'm serious, it was his 12th cast because I have it on video, and he. He made that 12 cast in the first two or three minutes of that fight on that fish, Steve, I'm telling him, you may have caught a sucker. It could be a sucker. Like the, yeah. the way it's acting, it could be a flannel mouth sucker. So just fight it like it's a big trout, you know, just, we weren't really excited. Well, then that fish, he got it up to the surface and he didn't really see it because of the glare of the sun. And I said, did you see that? He said, no, I didn't see it. I said, well, I don't want to give you buck fever. We have probably a 24 or 25 inch brown trout on right now. And he and he 
course, he said something I can't repeat on, you know, on the podcast. But he, <laughs> after that, we're laughing. And I was just like, just calm down. I probably shouldn't have said anything to you. Yeah. And we had had a situation in that same spot about two years ago during spring break. He was a sophomore on the baseball team, and it was before practice. And I had said to him, do you want to go fish? And before practice, just kind of kill some time. And he had hooked probably a 23 or a 24-inch rainbow. And I had forgotten my net. And and I didn't even realize I'd forgotten my net until he hooked that fish. And so oh. the whole time, this 15-year-old kid is like, you're supposed to be a fishing guide. Why don't you have a net? How is the land this thing? <laughs> so we'd been down this road before, right? And yep. and as soon as he had seen the trout after four or five minutes of fighting it, he, he looked over and he goes, you have your net, right? And I go, I got my net. <laughs> and so we ended up fighting that fish for, you know, however long it was. It wasn't a giant fight, but long enough. And yeah. And I uh, got him in the net and, uh, you know, almost lost him a couple of times coming around a rock and the fish is going right. And the rock, I mean, and yeah. anyway, we were able to get that big, giant, beautiful fish into the, into the net on the animus. And if what anybody's ever fished the animus before, it was a huge moment because, you know, like that fish has had to go through the chemical spill from the gold King mine. That fish has had to go through the 416 fire and all the sludge that came down Hermosa Creek you know, post monsoon yeah. and, you know, when we have an 85, 90% fish kill and that's one of those holdover fish that made it through all of those things and is sitting in there and there's an opportunity to do that within sight of like where the kid goes to school. I mean, like, I don't think some of the people around here, including myself really appreciate sometimes like what an right amazing experience it is. People yeah. go to New Zealand and Argentina and all these places to, to catch 25 yeah. fish and, and here we are in town on the 12th cast and literally we get it in and take a couple of pictures and release that fish nice and easy without messing with it too bad. And, and he says to me, he goes, can we go get lunch? <laughs> like <laughs> He was I done. Mean, like, that's just a kid living in Colorado, right? Like, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Let's Feed go get me. lunch, you know? But like, yeah, I just love that story because it's like such a cool, cool example of like what we have in our town to offer, you know? And it's just, we get to know those fish, right? I, I swear to you, I think I hooked that fish last July or August on a wade trip in that same spot with a guy, and it lasted like 10 seconds, you know, in the same exact spot behind the same two little rocks, and then we caught it in February, and it's like, man, I, I'd i like to think, kind of a cool idea that that might be the same fish, and just like yeah. people are taking care of those fish in that river and, and uh, you know afford you an opportunity to hook that fish a couple of times. So that's cool. Pretty cool. What yeah. a great moment. So I was in Colorado a couple of weeks ago with my son who's 33. And the last thing my wife said to me when we walked out the door is make sure you feed him. <laughs> so when you said your son <laughs> wanted to eat, that sounds pretty familiar. Totally. I'm like, we actually quit early one night to go eat at Twin Lakes uh, Lodge, I think it's called, and just had a fantastic uh-huh. meal, you know, and uh, I don't know. You got to keep him fed, you know, that's how you keep him happy catch a few fish and keep them fed well you know yeah that's the thing i was like i'm sitting there wanting to grab the rod and see if we can catch another fish but i think it's also a testament to the fact that like you know some of these kids that fish around here and some of these adults like man we caught that big beautiful fish it's not going to get any better than that today and this is 40 seconds from our house like yeah. we can come do this in a couple of weeks again you know and like you we were not going to take advantage of the resource we'd like we were given this amazing gift and and uh you know, we can now we can go to lunch and kind of celebrate that big, amazing fish for the rest of the day. So, how fun is that? Yeah, pretty cool. Did you coach your son in baseball? I did. Yeah, I coached him from T ball all the way up until this spring. I, you know, he's probably he's going to play baseball at a school up in Walla Walla, Washington, called Whitman College. And oh, good. And uh, he's gonna he's gonna pitch up there, and and I think he's uh, we've been talking about it a lot. His team just competed in the Connie Mack World Series in Farmington, which is the largest amateur baseball tournament in the country. And and he was able to pitch a little bit in that and for a really good team. And I think it was the first time that I've ever sat in the stands and watched him play. Yeah, because you're always coaching him, huh? Yeah, I was always in the dugout with him and could talk with him. He he caught for me for a couple of years and, and uh, he's always pitched. And so I think he's ready to, to get away to, to college and go do his own thing and become a man. And and, uh, you know, he's already there becoming a man, but it, like, you know, go away and gain his independence and play for somebody else in a college situation. And yeah. I'm excited to go visit. I think there's some really good bird hunting and some good fishing opportunities in that part of the country. So 
selfishly, I'm kind of hoping he finds the chuckers and finds the seal head and <laughs> calls me up and goes, Hey man, what are you doing next week? So <laughs> Gui- yeah. Son guiding dad, chucker fishing, that'd be, or t- yeah. chucker hunting. That'd be pretty cool. Someday maybe. You're a teacher too, right? I am. Yeah. I teach at Durango high school. I've taught, this will be my 24th year, I think, or 23rd year teaching, teaching American history and social studies at uh, Durango high school. So how'd you end up in Durango from San Diego? I played baseball at the university of Wyoming and uh, kind of had a back and forth. They, my junior year at Wyoming, they cut the baseball team because of title nine laws. And so I played my senior year at San Diego state for coach Dietz and then decided, you know, my grandparents had a place in Jackson, Wyoming, and we went there every summer Ooh. about this time of year, late July and all the way through August until a couple of days before football started. And so we would go to Jackson, Wyoming, honestly, for like two or three weeks and fish all through Jackson, Snake oh River, Black Creek, and the Grove Lawn, the Hobat, yeah. and all those rivers around Jackson. And that's where I really fell in love with fly fishing. And, and we fished a lot in San Diego, but we had bass and crappie and fished in the ocean. I worked on a, a boat out of Seaforth Landing for a couple of summers when I'd come home from summer baseball. And But uh, anyway, long story short, I played at Wyoming my junior year after playing a couple of years of junior college and then played at San Diego State. And then I decided to go back to Wyoming because I thought I wanted to live in Wyoming or Colorado and got my degree in teaching and nice with an emphasis in history and uh, got to Durango in 99 with my son's mother, we were engaged and, um, you know, looking for a place to live. She's from Jackson, Wyoming too, and looking for a place that was kind of fun in the mountains. And Durango is one of the places that we got jobs. And, and, uh, I think that was the fall of 99. And I started working in a old fly shop that's no longer in existence called Durango fly goods in the summer of 2000 guided a handful of fishing trips for them. And then 2001, I became a fishing guide in the summer and then I started guiding for Duranglers late in the summer of 2002 and started guiding for them in the summertime in 2003 so uh, been there for 20 21 years or something like that way to go fantastic and you're a bird hunter too what kind of what kind of bird dogs you got I have a German wirehair pointer he's eight oh in his prime he is in his prime he's a cool dog man I take him he grew up actually on my drift boat when he was a puppy and Ah. And on wade trips and stuff, I took him fishing with me the last couple of days. And a lot of people, I'm always like a little nervous to bring my dog fishing. You know, I can't take him on the boat in the summertime because it's just too hot. But but I'll take him to the mountains or on wade trips. And I swear it's like I bring that dog on a guide trip and everybody wants to talk to the dog and pet the dog. They don't really want to listen <laughs> to what I have to say. So hey, it's fish. kind of like a novelty. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's like a novelty, but he's a cool dog and he's really well behaved. And, we do a lot of bird hunting in, um, you know, out in the desert to the south of us here. And, and uh, I've taken him to Idaho and Nevada chucker hunting and Kansas pheasant hunting. And he's a cool dog. He's uh, Bird hunting and fly fishing kind of work hand in hand. I got two or three other fishing guide buddies that run English pointers and short hairs and lab. Yeah. We do. We try to travel a lot in the wintertime and get our dogs into some birds. So. What do you got down there? Chucker and quail? What do you guys hunt down there in southwest Colorado? Most, but we don't have a lot here, uh, directly in Durango. You know, we have like, you can shoot some ducks and, and, uh, we have grouse, we have dusky grouse or blue grouse. And, uh, there are some ptarmigan in the high country. That's kind of a, that's kind of a novelty hunt. You know, that's not there. They sit, they sit tight, but you know, most of what we're doing with our dogs is getting down into the desert and hunting gambles and scaled quail and, and, uh, sometimes Bob whites out to the east in Eastern Colorado. You know, we do have a small little population of gambles quail down by the San Juan, but you know, they're they're like needles in a haystack. You kind of gotta know that you're, you know, looking for a covey. So we have to drive, you know, four or five, six, seven hours to get to birds. But you know, it's it's easy rides into Arizona and a little bit in New Mexico, and and uh, we just again like some of those high country lakes. We just sort of look at big swaths of public land and go take off, and uh, that's cool. Find spots to hunt. Yeah. It's really fun. Really good feathers for fly tying. Right. One of those species of quail, they live in giant coveys, don't they? I can't remember which one it is. Like a bob white coveys, maybe eight to 12 birds. Yeah. Gambled quail on a big year and scaled quail on a big year. I mean, I've seen scaled quail up to 80, 100, 120 covey. I mean, that's no kidding on a big boom wow. year. Yeah. But the last few years, you know, we've had moderate 
at best rainfall in a lot of the places where we're hunting. So, you know, you're looking at 20 to 30, sometimes 40 bird coveys. But, you know, two or three years ago in Arizona, there was a really big boom year and everybody was touting it as like the best quail year in 35 years. And, and I did Arizona a couple of times and those gambles coveys were, they were 50, 70, 80 birds. And so, but then, you know, it's followed by a low rainfall year and you get back down into those, you know, 18, 20, 25, 30 bird oh, coveys, okay. which, you know, you get a bird or two and you move on as long as they're not, you know, getting shot up too much, but huh. you just, you know, try to be ethical. And, but I love that bird hunting. That's like, it's fun. I try to uh. keep a little stash of tip money in my, <laughs> yeah. in an envelope <laughs> for, for my shotgun fund and my bird hunting fund. For there you sure. go. Yeah. It's hard to walk by a gun store and not go in there and look at those shotguns, isn't it? You're kind of always itching to buy a new one. Shotguns and fly rods will be, right? the, they're the demise of many outdoors. <laughs> men, I, think. I always say, if you know how many shotguns and fly rods you have, you don't have enough. <laughs> yeah, there's always one that you need for more of a specialized something, right? Oh, something. if I had that nine and a half foot five weight, I could really throw that mend a little bit more. Yeah. If I had a 30 inch barrel on my 20 gauge, maybe I could reach out and touch that bird or right. You know, right. whatever. Yeah. And if you're on them, they go down. That's what I've found. Yeah. You know, exactly. That's pretty much that's it. All right, so talking about fly rods for a minute, you were talking earlier about how it sounded like maybe you guys are fishing some specialized rods for these big fish and light tippets. Like, what are you guys doing there with your fly rods? You can get fly fishing like anything else. You can get into it as much as you want or kind of stay pretty run of the mill. But, you know, just a basic nine foot five weight is what you see a lot of people fishing down here. Um, some people are getting into that 10 foot four weight game. I haven't yeah. really bought into that much yet, but a lot of people like that. I think a nine foot five weight is, you know, kind of a medium action rod. And, and, you know, I just have old sage. I don't, you know, some of the stuff when we're fishing, you know, out of a boat in the animus, you might want, you know, a little bit more backbone on that five or six weight thrown streamers or heavy nymph rigs or big dry flies. But a nine foot five weight is pretty standard issue. Like I fish a Sage X a lot and just a basic nine foot five weight. I know there's a lot of really new Orvis uh, rods that are really great that I've fished a couple of times, the Helios and whatever else. But I just, you know, I kind of have old school stuff and, and uh, you know, but I like a softer tip. I've gotten rid of all of my rods that are, that are a little more firm because, oh, you know, no it will just, yeah, it'll, it'll pull that, you know, for fishing on the San Juan. You know, because it'll pull that little tiny midge right out of that fish's mouth. Um, you know, if you set the hook too hard with an old school like tip flex orvis or some sort of you know faster action rod, it'll probably. So you'd want something smaller. Some guys, you know, you see uh, some of the men and women that are really uh, down at San Juan a lot, fishing more of like a softer nine foot four weight, a lot of Winston and things like that that are, you know, probably uh, hang that fish a little softer when you set the hook on a sure. twenty six midge and six X. So you see that quite often down there. Right. How much do you think the rod, it matters to land those big fish? Though? Is, it, is it really, is it more the skill of the angler or is it you got to have the right rod too to really up your odds of landing more of them? Well, I think any, you know, it's just, again, it's how, how badly you want it, right? Like some people like fly fishing is their thing. And so you see some of the people that are down there the, and they're really putting a lot of effort into what rod they have that, you know, gives them more of a... Um, I guess a benefit when they're an advantage when they hang that bigger fish. And, and I do think some of it is skill and just feel and experience, right? Like a lot of it is that, but you know, I can hand like some of my, just my real basic Reddington fly rods to people or my, my softer Orvis rods to people. And, and some of my rods that, you know, sometimes our rods break in the summertime for whatever reason, people break them or we break them and, you know, if I have to go back to some of my more faster action rods, you can definitely tell the difference when somebody sets the hook with a faster action rod, like old Sage one killer for casting, but probably aren't the rod you want for fishing a small midge on the same lawn. You know, you want something softer and, and uh, that will, you know, absorb the shock of that tippet, like I said before, and, and or on that tippet and, and keep that little small midge in that fish's mouth. And so I think the right rod in the right angler's hand ups your odds quite a bit yeah for sure so what are your top confidence patterns fly patterns for the san juan you know you're looking sizes anywhere from 18 to 26 uh just a crystal flash emerger um basic rs2s little small size 22 and 24 flashback pheasant tails 
like we call them big max it's or gorilla midges there's all kinds of names for it but like basically just like a 2487 the size 26 2487 is black thread and like clear larva lace with a black head at the top that's pretty basic you know cool. little black beauties and stuff just black thread with a little maybe like a micro copper wire or thin silver wire i mean there's all sorts of little fluff betas you know there's there's some really fun local ties at the fly shops that you know, some of the old school guys, John Tabner and, and you know, um, Davey Hawkins. There's all these old dudes that are not old dudes, but older dudes that have been around the river for a long time that have some pretty uh, signature patterns. Johnny Flashes, old dude named Johnny Gomez. that used to tie that fly a little bit differently than just a basic crystal flash merger. And if you, you know, poke around enough, WD-40, one of our guides, Mark Angler, is the guy who came up with the concept of the WD-40 years ago. And and so you see a lot of those midges, you know, midge patterns and betas patterns in the local fly shops. And it's always been one of my favorite things to do since I was a little kid was go into a fly shop at a river. And I don't want, you know, I love Royal Wolf, like my favorite fly, but like, what's a local fly? Like, give me something that, that you guys Yeah, use. the local tie. Yeah, like. Amen to that. Give me a dozen of those because that's pretty specific to this river and. So you can find that at any of the fly shops around Durango's carries them and some of the shops down there on the San Juan. And it's fun to grab those local patterns that, you know, I'm sure it would work other places, but we're tied with that particular betis, that particular midge in mind on the San Juan. That's pretty, right. pretty fun. To, uh, Animus River Special is a really cool streamer that I think John Flick and Tom Canopy came up with at the fly shop. Like, you know, it's just a sculpting pattern that's like that yellow you know, bucktail kind of looking thing, but with a big black deer head sculpt and head that's pretty specific to the animus and that works like charm. And so all those are pretty fun. Super cool. Would you be willing to take some pictures of some of these more local, less well-known patterns and send them sure. over to me? Sure. Yeah. Oh, some of them awesome. are so small I have to zoom way in, but yeah. I'll, uh, <laughs> I can do that for you for sure. People love to see that. I put those out on Instagram and Facebook. People really like that. I wanted to ask you about midges a little bit. So, you know, people that don't fish a lot of tailwaters, you know, what is a midge? Like, what are you fishing? Like, uh, you know, there's larva and pupa and all that stuff. Like, what are you guys fishing? A little bit of both. I mean, like a midge is just, I guess to put it in like layman's terms, it's just like a little, the way I describe it to people is like a little aquatic ant. I know that there's people that are not ants, aquatic gnat, you know, yeah. it lives in the water. And I know that there's entomologists out there that are probably like, you know, could give you the a to z but it's just basically like it's really super small they they clump up in clusters and so that's how we are you know we're really successful with those uh when we're fishing dry flies and more of like a, a cluster pattern like a big black stimulator a griffith gnat something along the lines there that doesn't represent just one midge it represents like 60 midges all clumped up on top of each other on the surface of the water and so they're very small they're prolific when you see them like I have a picture of one of my clients, you know, the waders the other day, and it's just like solid black with like thousands of midges up and down their leg. Oh, really? Yeah, they live in the water, come up, hatch, you know, fly around, do their mating, lay eggs, and the whole shebang. It's basic, basic entomology there. But, you know, you see them in tailwaters, smaller midges in colder water. And we have, that's like the main, it's kind of the staple bug here on the San Juan. And we're fishing things like, you know, little cream larvas, black midge pupas. It just depends. You kind of like experiment around, see what they're eating that particular day. You know, some of the more popular patterns are like bling midge. It's just a white, white midge larva with like a little piece of flash wrapped around the head so that that fish can pick it out of, you know, yeah. tens of thousands of them flowing down the river and catches their eye and you can tie them on a basic hook or you can put them on like more of a curve shank 2487 kind of thing or you know just kind of experiment around and see what you like some guys everybody's got names for it like you know i fish a crew cut midge i fish a bling midge i fish it, and all of them kind of <laughs> look the same they just have a different name you know a little different twist to them yeah but it's a definitely a micro fly i mean it's small like five and a half x six x seven x dippets just because the eye of the hook is so small you know and they're they're pretty prevalent on, you know, they're prevalent on any river. It's just like the tailwaters, you see those more, you know, there's midges all over the, you know, the animus, but like some days those fish are keying in on the midge, but a lot of times they're waiting until 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning and those fish will start to feed on like a PMD because it's more bang for their buck. Right. 
So, but yeah. the San Juan, because that fish sees midges all the time, 365 days of the year, they key in on that midge when there's a good midge hatch. And so, yeah. Are you fishing surface a lot of the time? It sounds like you are. Are you fishing a lot of dry flies? I would say a lot of times you see most people on San Juan fishing an indicator, but when you see people fishing a dry fly, you're like, haha, there's somebody, you know what I mean? Like that guy knows what's up or that girl's like pretty dialed in on what's happening here. Cause like two days ago, there was a midge hatch and those midge were, were clustered in rafts that were the size of like 50 cent pieces and silver dollars. And those bigger fish start to suspend and even like get right on the surface. And you can see those fish kind of like, They'll look at a, a a raft of midges that's like the size of a quarter, and they'll turn down. They'll they'll look away from it, and they'll look over here, and there's there's a raft of midges coming down that's like you know as big around as a racquetball, and they slurp down hundreds of those midges all at once. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's kind of fun to kind of fun to mess with those fish when they're doing that kind of stuff. So when they're eating those huge rafts of midges, what are the odds of them taking your fly? It's pretty good actually if you can get in the feeding rhythm, and you know you can sit there and. You know, I, I, dry fly fishing, a lot of people won't do anything, but, you know, especially down there, you know, when the water's clear and there's bugs, like I have a lot of friends that that's all they're doing. They're hunting around with a dry fly, but getting them to eat your fly, you know, a lot of times those fish, uh, those rafts of midges are coming down kind of a feeding lane. And, you know, if you're crafty with your cast and you can put like a big, you know, griff snat or black stimmy on that fish, you know, and put it just outside of his feeding lane, if he's fed to his left and you know, kind of sitting there, kind of regrouping, and then all of a sudden they see that big black stimmy coming at them. And some of those you can fish are size like 12s and 14s, but most of the time it's like 16, 18, 20s, just to kind of represent that more realistic, you know, view of what they're kind of looking for. You know, they they'll come over and eat your fly more time than not. They, you can okay. have some really, really good, really good dry fly days. And there's a there's an event that happens on the San Juan called the Ant Fall. It's the first good significant rainfall of the summer, and base uh, the long story short of what happens is, you know, like the next rain that we have on the San Juan, the ants would essentially what happens is like the water floods the ant holes and these big drone carpenter looking ants oh, okay. go flying around looking for new places to colonize and they'll land on the river, and they're these big flying ants and like every single fish in the river will come up and eat it. And and you some of those days are like uh, one of your questions was like what's an epic day like I think a few years back I had like four or five days in a row hitting the ant fall on the on the San Juan River and you can go in there with like a size I don't know fourteen or sixteen black peacock chubby Chernobyl ant and in this river that's been you know nothing but technical twenty six inch or twenty six midges and all of a sudden you're throwing a big foamy dry fly at that fish for two or three days after the the ant fall and you can catch these really beautiful kind of world-class fish on a dry wow. fly and you know terrestrials are a thing down there you can fish hoppers on the san juan that's kind of an overlooked thing but the ant pattern is probably like a staple you need to have in your box on the san juan and you can tinker with it right you can throw a size 20 flag ant or a you know a big size 14 you know it just depends like go play around and have some fun do something yeah. outside the box sometimes it's the old adage right like fish are eating nothing but elk you know like a size 16 caddis and you put a freaking double humpy on them and they come right up and eat your double humpy because it something looks like different. something different right yeah so right kind of the nature of the the game down there well, let me ask you this you've been guiding a long time teaching school and everything like what what gets you up in the morning gets you excited to go out and guide another day I just like being outside I think for me personally you know we all every single one of us in the summertime gets into these like, you know, 15, 18, 20, 25, 30, 40 day runs all over the West, all these fishing guides all over the country. Oh, yeah. really. And and it, it, it can be a grind for sure. But like, for me personally, the thing that's fun for me, I mentioned it earlier, is like today I got to go up and fish the Creek with some people that right below where I shot my elk last year, you know, and where I'll be bow hunting for elk this year. And I get to spend some time up there in one of my favorite places. And then tomorrow, I get to put my drift boat on the river and watch two really accomplished anglers like oh. take off after fish with a streamer in the morning for two or three hours. And then we're going to have a PMD hatch at about 1030 and we'll have, you know, a second to re-rig and start dry fly fishing for these really beautiful cut bows and rainbows on the animus that are like 
you know, in the section I'm going to fish tomorrow, you know, probably hasn't been fished a whole lot in the last few weeks. And, and I get to go do that tomorrow. And then the next day I get to go down to the San Juan and tangle with those fish in the middle of a mid chat. So like the diversity of what we have here is probably what keeps me going. And, and that's the selfish reasons, but I really do. I've always loved the concept of, and you have to remind yourself sometimes, but like, you know, coaching and guiding and all of that, like you can definitely get tired. I mean, everyone can get tired of anything. Right. But like, yeah. I think the part that's really awesome is like today I had an 11 year old boy and he'd never fly fished in a, a moving piece of water before. And he probably, you know, oh, cool. it's a brook trout Creek and he landed 15 or 20 little brook trout and he's got this big giant beaming smile on his face. Yeah. At one o'clock, <laughs> and his dad's all pumped and like, Oh, we're going to remember that forever. Like that's uh, what I think, you know, when you're addicted to the hustle of going out and working every day, those types of things are just, you know, that makes it worth it that maybe you make making memories. Back. Well, you're making memories and also you're kind of teaching lessons about conservation and, and uh, you know, how to like protect the resource. And this is so special because like we landed one little wild rainbow today on this creek that does not have a lot of wild rainbows anymore. And I mean, it was a big deal. I like lost it for this nine inch rainbow. Like, dude, bring me that fish. That's a nine inch, you know, it's a rainbow. And then we took pictures of it real quick in the water and just to like, I haven't caught one of those rainbows with anybody in two or three years. And I know, you know, a lot of people would, kind of scoff at a nine inch fish but like what a cool thing that 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 creek maybe is coming back with a wild rainbow and just i don't know those types of things are fun to me the the diversity and you never know what to expect and meeting new people all of it's pretty fun so yeah what what's your dream trip what's your dream destination i mean you're in a dream destination but where do you want to go you haven't been um you know since i was a kid i've always said new zealand i've always thought it'd be kind of fun to go hike around those those rivers in New Zealand and kind of spot and stock big fish. I think it'd be really fun to go down to like Argentina and do a little bit of trout fishing down there. Yep. You know, um, I've been watching a lot of videos the last couple of years on like the Seychelles. I think that I haven't done a oh, lot of yeah. saltwater fly fishing. And I think that would be really, really cool to go tangle with some of those yeah. GTs and, and fish and just like, you know, the ocean is its own separate animal. Like, Whole another deal. It's just, yeah could be so fun you know to get out there and get out into kind of a an adventurous place without a lot of people around so what's the one piece of advice if you could give one piece of advice to visiting anglers coming to the san juan what would it be listen like listen <laughs> to people like just a lot of people can come here with knowledge from a lot of other places just like we could all go to you know, I don't know, the Delaware, the Bighorn, all these rivers all over the country. And we could probably figure out how to catch fish, but like these tailwaters, you know, like the San Juan in the United States that, that we have this, this opportunity in the country to like learn something so specific in a unique landscape around really kind of unique people that know that river. And it just sounds like a plug to get a guide, but like, you don't even need to get a guide. If like, if you meet somebody that that knows what they're talking about. You know, the first fellow that ever really took me under his wing on that river was like a professor in midges and betas and little tiny flies. And like, he'd take, I mean, he used to take hair off of his German shepherds and make these crazy <laughs> little pupa patterns. And like, I, I mean, like, and he would do all these things. And I just was like soaking it up at the time. I think I was like 23 years old and was so interested in like the, the intricacies of that particular river you know, that here I am fishing this itty bitty midge, and but I could turn around and throw on a big white bunny leech and cast the other direction, and drag a bunny leech back at me and catch a different fish. You know, like, yeah, I, I just think that if you come here and you listen and, you know, I just think that camaraderie within fly fishing, like you would probably have something to offer me coming here to Colorado and New Mexico from where you're coming from that I could learn from. And you could be learning from me at the same time. And we're passing on this knowledge for such a great sport. And, and really kind of keeping it, um, you know, keeping that, that good, that good feeling, that good vibe going within the sport. I think a lot of people get so competitive nowadays on should you fish this and should you fish that, or that's ethical or that's unethical. And there's so many people involved in the sport now, but I just really think that if you come down and you're willing to learn and listen to some of the people that, that have so much experience on a, you know, a pretty, pretty cool tailwater that, uh, you can really go away learning something. I, I've always felt if you can come here and fish the San Juan with all of its intricacies and its, you know, its nuances and all these crazy little details that you got to pay attention to, man, it makes going to some of these places where you can put on a size six stonefly and a drop a 
size yeah. 10 prints and then pop you can tackle anything. On. Well, yeah, you can like just kind of makes it easier, right? It's like shooting your bow at 70 yards. It makes that 22 year old, 22 year yard shot on an elk that much easier, you know? So yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah. of the same way here. What's your, uh, all right, what's your favorite shore lunch? Do you make shore lunches for your clients? You know, we quit doing that during COVID, but I have a man, I'm not going to lie. I miss buying fried chicken for people. <laughs> I know right? a lot of people. I, I read a lot of stuff on blogs and old stories like, oh, the guy brought this cold, soggy fried chicken. But just a couple of days ago, Jim Sapello, one of my longtime clients goes, he was, I think he was eating like some wrap and on a tortilla with like whatever that is, you know, whoever had packed for, or he had packed for himself or he bought at the market. He said to me, he goes, you know, Rob, I really miss when you guys used to bring buckets of fried chicken. And this dude is like <laughs> is a super right? successful guy, you know, really, really kind of a well-known dude in the area. And, and he goes, I really miss it when you guys used to bring buckets of fried chicken and big jars of pickles. That was great. That's funny. <laughs> was like, that is funny. But yeah, I don't know. You know, when we were really trying to, really trying to impress people, I think, you know, with like the shore lunch thing, we were, everybody's kind of trying to outdo each other with some sort of new fancy designer chip right like we're in colorado so all these chip companies are coming out and, yeah and like a nice a nice lunch but you know we just haven't done lunch in a couple of years but uh you know it's fun to see people and what they bring for lunch you know every once in a while the client will bring us lunch now but you know when COVID hit we uh, the whole area kind of stopped bringing lunch yeah but i do i do miss i do miss fried chicken markets 645 getting the fresh chicken in the there was like science to it man you could get it like get it just warm enough so it wouldn't like you know get too much condensation on the bag and you wanted it in the in the bag with the holes not in the i know that seems yeah. silly but i love food so <laughs> there you go there you go all right speaking of food your favorite place for the hungry thirsty angler at the end of the day where do you where do you go um you have a couple options in town you know i always like me personally i love to go to mexican food so i love gazpachos is a great place in durango tequilas any of the mexican joints in town are really good to go and get a beer and some carne asada or whatever but you know some of the local restaurants that are really good i think it used to be called ken and susan i think it's 636 main that's really popular now we okay. actually have a couple of really good sushi joints in town which i know a lot of people go to colorado and sushi but like if anybody's ever flown fish home from alaska or something you know it gets here within with an hour so you know the, some of those are good like east by southwest and rice monkey are really good eolus is a restaurant right next door to the fly shop eolus um is really delicious and then there's seasons derailed poorhouse is real good there's a really cool place probably one of the coolest hangouts in durango right now is um they call it 11th street station and it's an old gas station and then i think for years it was like a kind of a rundown smoke shop but then one of the kids that I, I used to teach in class named Marcus Wisner he went out to New York and he worked as a chef and and then had his own food cart in New York and and then he came back and he and his dad kind of partnered up and they have this spot on 11th street on the corner and it's got a bunch of outdoor seating there's a bunch of food trucks that are there a really oh, cool nice. bar um, and that's a really kind of a favorite local spot for people to go and you have like five or six different options with all the food carts and then a really great bar and you can sit outside. Lots of they options. have live music a lot. And oh, very cool. Yeah, a lot of options. Durango is definitely a tourist town. It, has, it takes a lot to, uh, you got to be, you know, on your game to to keep up with all the tourists in town. And so, um, <laughs> you know, right? most of the places that are have been here for a few years do a good job because, you know, it's kind of like- They're discerning. Time tells, right? And time's, time's the ultimate, ultimate tell, so. Rob, thanks so much for being on the show. Great job. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate you. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. And, and uh, you know, we live in a great place and it's real pretty. And hopefully people appreciate it when they get a chance to come here. Get on down there and check out Duranglers. So how can people get in touch with you if they want to talk about, you know, the area or book a trip? Uh, Duranglers, phone number is 970-385-4081, uh, duranglers.com really cool website and easy to navigate uh you can call any of those guys down at the shop you know tom Knopic and john flick are the owners they've been in partnership together since 1983 they, they went to wow. school in kansas and, okay and uh so this is their 40th year 40th year they've had that fly shop in durango and it's a big deal and, uh, but you can give any of those guys a call and then uh they'll get in touch with us and and uh we can take you fishing 
Uh, if you go, well, listen, I wish you extraordinary success in all your adventures that follow. And folks, thank you for listening. We'll be sure to post Rob's uh, contact info or the shop's contact info and the Destination Angler show notes and pictures of all those top fly picks he was talking about on our Facebook and Instagram pages. You can DM me or email me with comments and suggestions at shag50 at gmail.com. Hope you enjoyed the show and we'll see you again soon. Tight lines, everybody. Well, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go From the land to the shining sea But I know, I know, I know, I know There's more to life than what the eye can see